Welcome back. Wasn't that just a, uh, a delight, a highlight to see? Just what a joy as a church to see that demonstration of God's grace. Um, we want to celebrate a, a, a different dem- demonstration of God's grace right now. It's just speaking to uh, Beth Adams, who some of you would know in the hall, and she was sharing a, just a testimony of how God worked in her life in this last week. I wanted to share that briefly um, just because I think it would encourage you as well. So she's um, trying to be careful with her foot a little bit, and so I'm going to have her just share from here and then explain a little bit what we're going to do with it. Is it on? Am I on? Can you hear? Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank God in front of everybody because, you know, I've been in a boot. Uh, this foot has been in pain for a year. It shouldn't have been like that. It's been on and on. And last Sunday, Bart came up to me, and you know, he didn't just say hi, how are you? He came up and says, "What's going on? Is it any better?" And and he said, "I told him no. It's not healing like it's supposed to." And and he said, "Well, we're, we're going to get together and pray for you this afternoon." And whoever that was, I guess his wife. Anyway, um, that was last Sunday. Monday, uh, I got up and I thought, "Huh, it's different." I mean, I still have a little bit of pain. I'm not in my boot. I'm in regular shoes. I mean, they, they're good for the kind of thing I got going on my feet, but I have an ankle brace on it. I'm not limping, really. I just get tired and sore. So I just wanted to thank God for that, because I know there are many of you that also have foot pain. And so God, I just, God is healer. And the thing that happened to me was I thought, he, he really does care. And he, even though you know there isn't, in the back you're like, am I being punished? It's like one thing or another. I think, no, no, no. It, it was in his time it happened. So be encouraged. Excellent. Very good. Very good. We enjoyed a a seminar on the person work of the Holy Spirit this last weekend. If you were there, thank you for coming. If you were not, we are going to swiftly seek to get those messages online. But I told the folks there, it it was more than just a seminar. It was something of a pastoral burden that our church would would lean into God's ability to do beyond what we uh, think he can do or beyond certainly our natural abilities. That's really why we pray. For things, we we pray for the sick, um, not just out of a, a sort of a duty. We we pray, hoping and trusting um, that God is able to heal, and He doesn't always, and we trust Him in the mystery of that. But we we do pray, believing that, um, and it's encouraging to hear that God has worked uh, in Beth's foot, and and we wanted to seize that also. Beth uh, had a little bit of an impression as well, uh, just a, a desire of faith, uh, to pray for anyone else in particular who suffers with that kind of pain. So if you, if you suffer with foot or leg pain in any particular way, um, after the meeting today, we're just gonna take a couple minutes. Uh, we're gonna invite you to come forward. And in the midst of my preaching, if I forget about this, uh, which is possible, uh, Aaron will remind me at the end, but we'll just have you come over here and um, we will just pray for you at the end. But thank you, Beth, for sharing. And Bart, thank you for your faith uh, to pray. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians has been changing me, changing us as a church, I hope. I believe that it has been. And we are now entering chapter 4. Chapter 4. So Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 1 through 3 this morning. Verse 1 through 3 in Ephesians. So let's, let's read that together. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's ask God to help us this morning. Lord, we we thank you so much for the joy of witnessing those testimonies and those baptisms and celebrating with our sister as you've worked in her life. And we, we just enjoy seeing your power on display. And Lord, we know that your power attends the preaching of your word. And so I ask, Lord, that you would attend your word with power this morning. Lord, you know the burden that I have that this passage would imprint itself on our church. But only you can do that. I pray that you would. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was um, reading a little bit, looking up uh, some, of the, some of the creeds or statements that various military branches use uh, when they are committing themselves, particularly the officers, I think, when they're committing themselves to their duties. And I, 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 I know I'll probably get in trouble uh, from the Army uh, presence in our church, uh, but there is also an Air Force presence, so hopefully we're all on the same team here. Uh, but I, I, I was struck uh, by the, the Air Force Creed. It's a new one, so maybe the old one was, was lame and they had to measure up to the Army's one or something. Uh, but there's a new one, uh, April 2007, relatively new, that came out. And here's what it says. I am an American airman. I am a warrior. I have answered my nation's call. I am an American airman. My mission is to fly, fight, and win. I am faithful to a proud heritage, a tradition of honor, and a legacy of valor. I am an American airman, guardian of freedom and justice, my nation's sword and shield, its sentry and avenger. I defend my country with my life. I am an American airman, wingman, leader, warrior. I will never leave an airman behind. I will never falter, and I will not fail. I'm struck by that particular creed because of the way each phrase begins. It begins with a statement of identity, of calling. I am, it says. And in particular, it says later on that I have answered the call of my nation and I will defend a, a heritage, a tradition, even with my life. I will uphold, it seems to be saying, this calling. And, and, and that is exactly what Paul is saying here. Paul, in this verse, transitions. We have reached the midpoint, theologically, exegetically, the midpoint of this book of Ephesians. He has been talking about the glory of God's grace in chapter 1, from eternity past, called by grace. Chapter 2, called out of sin. Chapter 3, called into a fellowship of believers, a community of believers. And this, this panorama of God's grace that Paul has put on display, he summarizes in verse 1 of chapter 4 by saying, You have been called, he says. And now I have an appeal to make in light of who you are and what God has done. This opening verse, verse one, could be seen as a title for the remaining three chapters of Ephesians. It's not just a verse, it's also a topic. Everything that, that flows out of these passages flows from this appeal. Paul makes a, a call, he says. And, and in Ephesians, though the call certainly references every aspect of life, certainly the call of God. In Romans, he does the exact same thing, does the same thing in Philippians. Paul's always doing this, talking about the gospel and then transitioning to say, how do we live out that calling? He's always doing that. It's the way he writes. But, but in this book, his particular concern and, and particular emphasis, almost exclusive emphasis, is how we live out that calling in terms of the church. Now, that's an emphasis in all of his books, but it is a particular emphasis in Ephesians, and it is that emphasis that led us to title this Together in Christ, this whole series. Because there's this accent, there's this context that Paul emphasizes. How, how do you live out the calling that you've received, where there's a context of relationships that is the place where the worthiness of the gospel is demonstrated. Here's how I would summarize what Paul is saying here. If we take these, these three verses, our relationships must reflect our calling. Our relationships must reflect our calling, or to expand on that a bit, the way we live toward each other must reflect the honor of our gospel calling. The way we live toward each other must reflect the honor of our gospel calling. Relationship must reflect calling. 
That's what Paul would say. And it, it strikes me that when you are an army officer or a military officer, there's also a, a, a fear that every officer has, and, and that's uh, being court-martialed for conduct unbecoming an officer. I was reading about that. Conduct unbecoming is a technical military phrase, and, and it's a, it's a court martial. My understanding is it is a court martialable offense. Conduct unbecoming, and if you read the definition, it's, it's conduct that is not in keeping with the honor and the calling. It's exactly what Paul is saying here. There is a way of life that demonstrates the worthiness of your calling, and there's a way of life that does not that does slander to your calling. And it, it struck me as similar to when a, a military person would be brought before a, a, a military court and you have committed conduct unbecoming, not in keeping with, not up to the par of, the honor. And even a, a non-military person can appreciate that. There's callings and there's a standard of conduct that reflects well on that calling, that represents that calling righteously and appropriately. And as Christians, Paul has been saying for three straight chapters, consider the glory of your calling, the grace of it, the eternity of it, the community of it, the miracle of it. You are a called person beyond all thought and imagination, beyond all privilege. You've been brought into a community of all privilege. Oh, the, the calling, Paul would say. And now, your relationships, the way you live toward each other, there should be conduct becoming conduct in keeping with, reflecting the honor of your calling. Relationships must reflect calling. I'm going to break this passage into to two sections. Paul begins with this, this appeal. I'm going to call that the mandate for our life, the mandate for our life. And then he gives the marks of that relationship context. So the mandate and the marks are going to be the two sections. The second one will be longer. First, the mandate, and you see this flow in the passage. I, therefore, I, therefore, Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, the mandate is that you walk in a manner worthy. That's that conduct in keeping with. That's the central command here. I urge you, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. But in addition to the, the direct mandate, Paul attaches motivation. There's motivation attached to this mandate. First motivation is personal. Paul says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. And Paul is, is, is unashamed to use his personal example. You see this throughout his letters. His personal example as a motivator for the Christians he's writing to. Jesus did the same thing. Uh, there, was this, there was no false humility about Paul. He was able to look at himself and say, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. And I think there's supposed to be a, a kind of rhetorical motivation as he says that. To be in the Lord is to declare your willingness to do anything, including giving up your freedom for his sake. I'm a prisoner for the Lord, Paul says. I, I, I'm willing to go to prison. I, I'm willing to give up my freedom for the Lord. That's how high a calling, that's how I am living worthy of the calling. Because I've declared my freedom is not worth uh, giving up the calling that I've received. I, a prisoner for the Lord. So this calling might require sacrifice, Paul implies, for the sake of brothers and sisters in the gospel. A prisoner for the Lord. It's a lot of motivation. Look, look here. Here's, here's what it looks like to live in a way that is worthy of the gospel. It's to so serve the Lord in outreach to your brothers and sisters, as I have done, that you would even be willing to go to prison. A prisoner for the Lord. It's this motivation behind the mandate. Then, then he adds this theological motivation. Worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
Again, that's that standard, being, uh, becoming, becoming the calling, be, being in keeping with the calling. So we might say that as you look back at each chapter in Ephesians, one is to take it as a recipient, and then in light of chapter 4, verse 1, the other is to ask, how can I reflect this? We receive the gospel, and then we reflect it. We don't replace the gospel, but we do reflect it. Important distinction. We don't become the gospel to other people. That kind of language is unhelpful and unbiblical. But we do reflect the character traits that we've received. We receive, and then we reflect, and that's the basic ethic of the New Testament. What does it mean to be a Christian in terms of your morality? It means to reflect the attributes of God displayed in the person and work of Christ. If you want to know what it means to obey God, one way you could put it is to reflect the attributes of God that are revealed in the person and work of Christ. And so Paul is assuming that you have been affected by the grace of God and the patience of God and the miracle that sinners have become saints and been drawn to the God of eternity. And he's saying, now I'm I'm assuming that you're affected by the majesty of that calling. Now, 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 here's a a further privilege that you have to reflect that calling in your relationships. That's the mandate. Live worthy of the gospel. In your relationships, reflect the glory you've received in the gospel. You have been commissioned in Christ. Now, live worthy of that calling, Paul says. That's the mandate. That's the appeal. And then he spells it out, really for the next three chapters, but we're going to look just at these three verses. And these might be called the marks of our relationship, the marks of a relationship that is living worthy of the gospel. What's the standard? What does it look like? Give me some idea, Paul. I need some clues. I need some direction. How how do I do that? I, I want to do that. What does it look like? Help me be practical. Paul says, I'll help you be very practical. Here's what practically it looks like to live worthy of the gospel in the context of your relationships and this new community God has built. Five marks for our relationships, five marks that we are aiming for as we seek to obey Paul's urgent appeal that we would live in a manner worthy of the gospel in our relationships. Five marks. You notice them right there. I'm just going to walk right through these. First, he says, with all humility. Five marks, okay? The first one, with all humility. What does it look like to live worthy of the gospel? This is my calling. It is your calling that your relationships would reflect your calling. You're called to this. I am called to this. This is God's intention for our life. We don't have to wonder what's God's will for my life. It is right here that you would live worthy of the gospel. And here's the first mark practical of what that means, humility. It is no mistake that Paul starts this list with humility. It is no mistake It is no mistake because gospel reflecting relationships must be grounded in personal humility. Must be grounded in personal humility. The soil of pride always produces anti-gospel fruit. The soil of pride, it always produces anti-gospel fruit. But the soil of humility, it produces gospel reflecting fruit. This This is a foundational mark Humility, a, an accurate view of ourselves in light of the holiness of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how I would define humility, an accurate view of ourselves in light of the holiness of God and the salvation of Christ. That's what humility is. It's not making up the view that we are worthless and lowly. It's simply accurately agreeing with who we are in light of the holiness of God and the salvation provided by Jesus Christ. That's what humility is. And we need to, we need to fight for personal humility within the context of the local church. We have to respond to this appeal ultimately so that we can reflect the honor of the gospel that has saved us. John Stott, a well-known quote, you may have heard this before, but it's worth repeating. The author, John Stott, says, at every stage, and please hear this, if if you've been a Christian for 30 years, uh, you need this just as much now as you ever did. At every stage, he says, of our Christian development, 
and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. Now we have to reverse our natural inclination. We tend to think people are our greatest enemy and self-preservation is our greatest friend. There's a, 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 a great psalm uh, where the wicked are, are described as saying, our tongues are with us, who can stand against us? That strikes me as very, very uh, convicting of my own way of speech at times. Our tongues are with us, I can protect myself. All I need is my tongue. I can keep you at bay simply by what I say. Paul says, they and that person who does those things, that's not your, your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is your own pride because your greatest calling is to live worthy of the gospel, not to protect yourself. A longer quote from Jonathan Edwards, but it was too good for me not to quote this morning. He says this, spiritual pride tends to speak of other person's sins with bitterness or with laughter and levity and an air of contempt. But pure Christian humility, rather, tends either to be silent about these problems or to speak of them with grief and pity. Spiritual pride is very apt to suspect others, but a humble Christian is most guarded about himself. He is as suspicious of nothing in the world as he is of his own heart. The proud person is apt to find fault with other believers, that they are low in grace, and to be much in observing how cold and dead they are, and to be quick to note their deficiencies. But the humble Christian has so much to do at home, and sees so much evil in his own heart, and is so concerned about it that he is not apt to be very busy with other hearts. He is apt to esteem others better than himself. Now, I've found it to be true in, in my experience and experience of those I've watched that pride is so stubborn and pervasive uh, that it can turn a definition of pride into a, an excuse to point out a lack of humility in someone else. Um, it's, it's impressive. Oh, no, no, you're supposed to be most concerned about your own heart. <laughs> and, and somehow pride switches around it. No, no, the, the, the point is I, I, I am supposed to be. Humility is not a measure to be prideful toward others about. <laughs> it is a grid to evaluate our own heart. When we consider humility, we're not thinking, yeah, I, I know some proud people. We're thinking, no, no, my own heart. I, I'm concerned. I love Edward's phrase. He's busy enough. <laughs> He's busy enough at home. He's busy enough at home. He's busy enough at home. He, he has no need to be busy with the sins of other people. Why, why does Paul start with humility? Because he knows it's our greatest friend. If we are really most desirous, more desirous of protecting ourselves, of vindicating ourselves, of our ambition, of promoting, if we really are most desirous of living worthy of the calling to which we have received, well then... Humility is our greatest friend, and pride is our greatest enemy. I remember uh, being at a conference one time, and I, they, I was young, but I guess the band, uh, I play piano, and so they, they needed a piano player, and I don't know why they chose me, but they, they wanted me to fill in. And if I remember correctly, there was a point in one of the um, times of singing where they were going to have guys do like some soloing and it was going to be kind of this fun band moment. Well, they pretty much had everybody do a solo but me. And I think the main reason was they had no confidence in what a solo for me would sound like. And I remember just being so disappointed by that and discouraged. And at a different point in the same conference, I remember realizing, man, I'm just so depressed. Why am I so depressed? This is a conference. It's fun. Lots of friends are here. Should be having a great time. Like, why am I so down? I've been down the whole time. And it was one of those moments where it was like the Lord just very gently just whispered in, you're down because you're thinking all about yourself. Ding, 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 ding. There it is. Yes. Okay. I, th there it is. That would be depressing. I am, I am thinking all about myself. That's what I'm thinking about. I do that all the time. Do you ever find yourself 
thinking about how you could have been funnier in a previous conversation, man, that would have been better to say that. I do that all the time, wondering why other people's service is noticed and yours not, or here's a good one, when other people get the credit for the thing you did. That, that happens sometimes as a preacher, uh, you know, just like inner confessions of a preacher. You, you'll preach a message and you remember it, and like years later, somebody will say, man, there was this great message, and you know, I, I think it was Aaron, and he was preaching, and man, it changed my life. And you're there saying, it probably would serve them if I just would inform them um, you know, this is really like an integrity moment. I can't, I, am I lying to let them suffer under this false? And probably I am. I probably need to say, yeah, that, that was, um, Aaron's great, but that one was actually me. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because our hearts are just attention, elevation, promotion, self, me. Why does Paul start with humility? Because he knows pride is an energetic sin. It's always looking for fresh ways to preserve itself. We are those who find our worth not in the applause of men, but in the grace of God. Humility, first mark of living worthy of the gospel in the gospel community. Second mark, gentleness gentleness, Paul says. He ties them together, I think, probably because they relate to one another. If you are humble, you will be gentle. All humility and gentleness. Gentleness is the opposite, if we think of the opposite of rage or harshness. It's a person who is tender and delicate toward those around them. Gentleness is, is not a lack of strength, but it's the ability to apply strength in firm and sensitive kindness. It is not crushing. It is upholding. That is gentleness, and no wonder it's a mark of living worthy of the gospel because the gospel centers around the Savior. And Matthew chapter 20, or chapter 12, verse 20 says, A bruised reed, speaking of Jesus, he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. This is the description of our Savior. He has this ability to take a bruised reed and to be gentle with it. He doesn't see a bruised reed as mostly gone and not worth the effort. He sees it as still holding on and worth preserving. That's our savior. And so if we're living worthy of the calling we've received in him, Paul would say, yes, gentleness. Oh, don't, don't we need this word as, as parents and as children? I mean, last night, last night, I needed the word gentleness to penetrate my soul. Last night, we were, got home a little bit late. I was putting my children to bed. And it was just one of those nights where they had a lot of extra questions. And finally, I would get them finally down. And then I would come and, okay, now we're going to rest. And daddy, and I got to go back. Okay, yes, yes, son, what is it now? And as I'm walking to their rooms, I'm having to control the impatience and the temptation to a lack of gentleness that can come out of my voice. The difference between stay in your bed and stay in your bed might just be a lack of gentleness. But the gospel is this picture of a God who is gentle, who treats us as little children, even babies, it says in the scripture. That is a mark. So let me encourage us as a church, where is there an occasion for you to display gentleness? And, and let, me, let me frame all of these marks in a particular way. I trust that every time we preach God's word, there, there's gonna be conviction about past failures. There should be, God's word should convict us. And we repent and we grow and we change, that's what God's word does. But I, I, I think we also wanna see this as a delightful goal and that changes our view of those around us. People who give you the opportunity to exercise gentleness are a gift to you. Because without those people, you could not display one mark that the gospel has transformed your soul. If everyone around you uh, caused you no need to display gentleness, if it was easy to be gentle with those around you, th there would be no evidence that you've been called out of the natural working of this world. Anybody can be gentle with someone who always serves them, is always loving, is always kind. 
Easy to be gentle with a person like that. The reality is, and Paul knows, that most Christians at some point or another are not easy to be gentle with. It's much easier to be harsh and firm and in in an aggressive way demand that they be something because they are, frankly, annoying right now. And so be gentle with them, Paul says, because they're hard to be gentle with. And that reveals the gospel. Be gentle. I think this is a great application for us as parents. Gentleness. Jesus is full of authority and gentle. Able in the same meeting to rebuke Pharisees and heal the sick. Gentle. Third mark, patience. These are all tied together, but each gives a different facet of this diamond that is living worthy of the calling to which we've received. Patience. Patience seems to be the willingness to wait, not in a hurry to demand a certain outcome towards those in our gospel community. I remember um, having a a wonderful fellowship time with some folks. This was before we planted this church, a different church. And we were just playing a game. We were just playing a game. We were having a great time. And it was one of those games that you, you do sort of hot potato and you're trying to pass the thing to the next person as quickly as possible. And there was a particular individual who was playing this game that this just didn't suit their personality. It just wasn't, they're not into doing things swiftly. Um, they were more of a meditator. And so they would, they would receive um, this, this little item and its catchphrase is the game if you've ever played it. And they're, they're reading and, and, and they're sort of thinking, <laughs> thinking about different ways, I guess, that you could possibly describe this for your teammate and everyone else is, is blurting things out and they're just kind of sitting there. And this happened, had happened a couple of times. And the person next to them finally um, simply couldn't take it anymore. And I think unintentionally, it was just reaction, just sort of exploded. Why are you so slow? <laughs> and the person was shocked, and this person was shocked that they had said that. It just sort of burst, and then everybody kind of just looked around and chuckled, like, well, that was a little bit revealing, wasn't it? <laughs> but frankly, that comes out of our heart all the time. <coughs> Why are you so slow? Why are you slow to change? I mean, we've been talking about this category for decades. Why are you so slow to obey, little child? Why does it take you so long to get to our meetings? Why do I have to wait for you? Again, let me frame this as an opportunity. Yes, it's convicting where we lack patience, but let's frame it as an opportunity. When people tempt you to impatience, rather than thinking of them as in the way of your Christian life, we should think of them as necessary to displaying our Christian life. Do you understand what I'm saying? What is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian when they face an obstacle? What is the difference? And how can you demonstrate or reveal the worthiness of the gospel if you never encounter the temptation to impatience? The point is, you cannot. And so people that tempt impatience are an opportunity without which you could not display the patience that is revealed in the gospel toward you and toward me. I think we need to reverse our thinking. Sometimes we, we think, and you maybe have heard this, this phrase before, I love it when there's just friendships that click. Don't you love those friendships that just click? They like everything I like, I like everything they like, and even the things we don't like, we kind of enjoy not liking them, and this, you know, and it's kind of fun. And we tease each other, and it just sort of works. I love those relationships that click. And then you meet a new relationship, and it doesn't click. And you think, Oh, this is going to be lame. When can we find a new person that clicks better? I like the clicky people. There's nothing wrong with relationships that flow naturally. Wonderful. God uses that. In my experience, that's somewhat rare in the Christian life. 
that you just flow into a relationship and it's as though we've been friends for years and we can miss time and then get back together and we're right back where we were. I've had those relationships. Many Christians have. In my experience, they're rare. Most relationships have some aspect that is rough, bumpy, and annoying. We tend to view those as the unfortunate aspect of what could be a delightfully easy Christian experience. That's not the Christian life. That's river tubing. That's not what we're called to. How easy can my relationships be before I die is not the desire of the Christian. The desire of the Christian is, how can I live worthy in a way that reflects the worthiness of the gospel? Now, I'm not saying we're masochists. I'm going to find the grumpiest, most difficult to befriend person in any church anywhere, and they're going to be my best friend. No, no, no. God will take care of the difficulty for you, okay? You don't have to look for it. But when it comes, don't be annoyed. Don't run. Rejoice at the opportunity you have to display the gospel, because easy friends, as delightful as they are, they don't always present the same opportunities to display the marks of living worthy of the gospel. If we go back to the military analogy, this has been true, at least historically in the military, they would say, if you don't at some point see some kind of difficult responsibility, there will be some question in the minds of your superiors about whether you should be promoted. And if we apply that to the Christian life, I think the Lord knows that. Look, if, 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 if there's never any difficulty relationally, what really is different between the church and a football game crowd? God is not interested in a natural kind of unity that displays a natural kind of allegiance. He's interested in a supernatural kind of unity that displays a supernatural passion towards the worthiness of a supernatural gospel. So when you encounter the bumps and the bruises and the difficulties, and why do you do that? It's so unnecessary for my life that you be this way. When you encounter that kind of moment with a Christian, First, I'm sure you'll sin, as I will, and think, what a loser. But the next thing you can think is, no, wait, wait a minute, what, what did we just read? This is an opportunity to display the gospel. Apart from your impatient-inducing tendencies, I wouldn't have the opportunity to display patience. The next mark here is, is just kind of a, a further, I think, a... a a building upon the last mark, bearing with one another in love, it says. Bearing with one another in love. If patience is this idea of, of waiting uh, over a process that is slow, bearing with has the idea of feeling the weight of a person's weakness and sins, bearing with them, experiencing some of the pain of what, what they do towards you. Patience is, is waiting for the slowness, bearing with is kind of feeling the pain over a period of time and doing it in a, in a context of love. You see why these are, these are supernatural displays. This is not natural. The most natural thing in the world, when someone sins against you, and especially when they do it where you have to bear with them, so it's repeated, it happens again and again, it's a, it's a weight, is to say, that's about enough of you. I've about had it. I have enough to carry, thank you very much, besides your sin. But it's precisely at that point that we see the connection to the gospel. I'll tell you this has been true in my own life. Some of the moments where I am aware that I am on the receiving end of someone's sinful nature are some of the moments when I'm most aware of what it meant that Jesus bore my sins. Now, I, I never replace what he did. This isn't a, a new gospel. But it just expands my understanding a little bit. Just the smallest, tiniest little bit of, of, of greater glimpse. Okay. Okay. I'm feeling weight because this sister... Uh, gossiped about me or this brother uh, kind of snapped at me or this brother 
fail to do what he said he would do. I'm, I'm feeling that. I mean, it's, I kind of have my life, and then there's this thing over here that, oh gosh, it's like a weight. What does the scripture say? Live worthy of the calling to which you have been called. One way you can live worthy of the calling that comes through a sin-bearing Savior is to bear in love the sins of your brothers and sisters in Christ. If I haven't already sinned against you, I promise you I will. I promise you I will. I'll sin in selfishness. I won't call you back sometime. Or I'll, I'll sin uh, by joking and trying to be funny and actually it'll hurt your feelings and I, I didn't control my tongue. Or, or, or I'll sin. I, I had to confess the other day I was talking to someone and I felt like I sinned in my speech by something I said. I had to call them back and say, brother, would you forgive me? That was, that was sinful speech. That, that person, what do they do at that moment? They maybe have experienced that from me before. I, I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know when I'm sinning against someone else and, and they have to bear with that. I'm, I'm so grateful for brothers that will bear with my sin. I, there's no one I'm more grateful for in this regard than my wife. She bears with my sin. Sin that I see and sin that I don't see. She bears with it. She carries it. It's a part. It's a, really, it's an unchanging part of her Christian walk. And I, I hope God's changing me. I hope God's changing you. But the people around you, they're bearing with something. There's some aspect of your sin. Maybe it's your laziness. Maybe it's your condescending tongue. Maybe it's your, your bitterness. Maybe it's your complaining. Maybe it's your selfishness. Maybe it's your bragging. I don't know what it is. I mean, you, you pick the thing. But at some level, you're, you're kind of tossing chains around the people around you catch and then they catch and then you say and I'd love for you to walk with me in the Christian church here's my chain hope you can carry this a long way because I'm not going to die soon and then you kind of walk with them and they carry they carry it oh yeah Jimmy and his selfishness here it is again I, I, had, a, I had a friend that was in a different church and and God has, has changed him in significant ways but when he was young in the Lord um, he would just talk about himself all the time. He was actually phenomenal in how long he could go describing himself. It was actually quite impressive. And, and he would just talk. And this, and I do this, and I understand this, and I know about this, and I know this. And, and, and there was, there's a little while where you're, you're gracious and patient, and then you start to feel the ache and the creak of your bones under the weight of the sheer length of time you can describe your accomplishments. And, and finally, you just start to shake under the weight of it and think, I'm not sure I'm built for this. This, this, uh, this, this weight is a little beyond my, my normal pressing ability here. Yes, exactly, God says. Exactly it is. There's only one who's borne the weight of every sin and it's punishment. It was Jesus Christ. He bore your sin. So let this give you just, you don't, you're not even having to bear the guilt of it. You're not having to bear the wrath of it. You're just having to bear the immediate inconvenience and pain of it. So that's just like the smallest little sense of what's happening here. But you're getting a little bit of a glimpse of what it meant that Christ bore your sins. Good. You'll understand the gospel a little better now. And you can reflect it by bearing with that brother, bearing with that sister. Where is someone sinning against you in this church? It's happened somewhere. If, if it's not happening, uh, you're either not involved enough or you're lying to yourself. Somebody is going to sin against you or already has or I have or and, and yes, there's conflict resolution and things we do and encouraging each other in love. And, uh, definitely we do that. I'll get to that. But, but the, the starting place is it's a privilege to bear with those whose sins bore down Christ on the tree. The authors of the book Relationships, A Mess Worth make, Making, 
Timothy Lane and Paul Tripp say, relationships will push you beyond the limits of your ability to love, serve, and forgive. They will push you, they will push you beyond you. At times, they will beat at the borders of your faith. At times, they will exhaust you. In certain situations, your relationships will leave you disappointed and discouraged, maybe disillusioned. How can a Christian act that way? They will require what you do not seem to have. I would say, what you do not have. But that is exactly as God intended it. What does it force you to do? This passage works both ways. There's the mandate that drives you to the marks, and there's the marks that force you back into fresh meditation on the motivation. I don't want to bear with this person right now. They're too heavy. Got to go back to chapters one through three. Got to learn more. Got to see more. Got to love it more. Got to receive more. Got to glory more in the gospel so that I can go back again with fresh motivation to bear the weight of this sinner. Final mark, maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Quick comments about this phrase. The unity of the spirit means the unity that the spirit has created. The spirit has brought together Jew and Gentile. Paul's been saying we could say people from every background, every history, every age, every generation, every nation. He's brought them together into community and he's created a unity. He has established it. It's not being established. It is established. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this wonderful little, little book called, uh, uh, I think it's called Life Together. And when he wrote that book, he talked about, it's important to know you have unity with other Christians. You have it. You've been given it. You are unified because you're saved by the same Savior. You're unified by the same Holy Spirit. And the description of what this is, is a bond of peace. There has been reconciliation. The alienation that was a result of sin has been broken in the person work of Christ so that every race, every ethnicity, every cultural background has been brought into a place of peace. That's why racism has no place in the church. That's why condescension towards different cultures has no place in the church because the Holy Spirit has created this unity, this peace together. There's no place for the kind of alienation that comes as a result of sin. But you have something to do in light of what he has created. It's, it's a fascinating and sobering word. Look at that word, maintain. Maintain. Now here's the mystery of sovereignty and responsibility in the Bible. Ultimately, God will preserve his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the Christians work to maintain the unity that God has created. They have to work. They have to maintain. They have to Hold it in. Now, ultimately, God is holding it in through there, holding it in, and there's a mystery there. But, but it's going to feel like you are maintaining it. From your perspective, from my perspective, it's going to feel like we're, we're holding it in. You may have noticed in the baptismal out there, which is actually a swimming pool, um, it looked like uh, it was, it, the water might kind of come flowing out and disperse and be less effective in baptizing people. And so there was, there was men there serving and, and holding, holding that water together, holding the pool together. Well, that's what the Christian does. Maintaining, fighting for, concerned about, desiring the unity of the church. Not a uniformity, a unity in their diversity, a unity not of perfect Christians, but of imperfect sinners, which is why we need the exhortation. Maintain the unity that has been created by the Holy Spirit through the person and work of Christ. Maintain the unity, Paul says. Fulfill the marks of a life worthy of the gospel. Let your relationships reflect your calling, Paul says. Humility, patience, gentleness, bearing with one another in love, maintaining the unity. Now, let me just make one point about conflict in the church. In my experience, most deep conflict in the church is not doctrinal. It is sin exploding. That may be your experience too. Sometimes it's doctrinal. But, but normally, conflict in the church, it's sin exploding. This is actually exactly what James says. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? 
that your passions are at war within you. Kind of takes all of the air out of the he makes me so angry remark. Your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. What's James saying? If you want a cause for conflict, look inside. You, you want something and you're not getting it. Maybe you want the experience of living without the sins of other Christians and you're not having it. So you murder, you fight, you quarrel, James says. Paul says, maintain the unity. Maintain it with other sinners, other failures like you, other weak Christians, burdensome, chain-tossing Christians. Bear with them. A couple recommendations about conflict. I got a long list and then I got a more memorable list, okay? So the long list is just because I'm I don't know, a pastor and feel the need to be specific. So the long list says, uh, start with the gospel. When you experience sin or what you think is sin or even just difficulty for another person that you think might possibly be the result of sin in their heart and you experience that heat that comes out of you in reaction to what they are doing, whenever that happens, here's some things you can do. Start with the gospel. Start with the gospel. Go to the Lord and remember how you have been saved. Remember, I am in Christ. More important than whatever this person is doing to me, whatever this person is doing to me, is the fact I am in Christ. Start with the gospel. Second step, confession. Go to your own heart. When I was a kid, one of the great gifts I feel like my dad gave me in his parenting, when we were in the midst of conflict, he would insist, before you look at their heart, you look at your own heart. Confession. Confess, maybe to the person, maybe to the Lord, where am I sinning? Now, you might be sinning in reaction to their sin, or you might have initiated it in some way, but, but if you're angry, and there's this heat and frustration, likely there is some idolatry at work in your soul that needs to be confessed to the Lord. Step three, overlook with love. That's a biblical category. Not to be applied every time, but many times we overlook the sins of others. We, we, we choose to not look at them. I don't think every sin is an occasion for confrontation. There are many sins we simply overlook. If that doesn't seem possible and there seems to be a continuation of the conflict, the next step after you've looked to the gospel, after you've confessed your own heart, after you've tried to overlook with love is to ask humbly. We never go to another Christian with conclusions that we see as the Holy Spirit does exactly what's going on in their heart. We ask humbly, would you consider, brother, that this statement that you made, that this pattern in your life would you take this to the Lord and, and consider whether perhaps it is, it is not honoring to the Lord? Would you consider this? That should be the standard way we bring observations. It's never, are you aware of what a sinner you are? It's always, would you consider, take this to the Lord? Have you considered possibly that the way you say this or the way you act in this way is ungodly? Take it to the Lord, sister. Have you considered it should never be shock and surprise and awe at a person's sin. I heard a pastor say one time, surprise at a person's sin usually reveals self-righteousness. How could you? Usually reveals self-righteousness. <laughs> ask humbly. Now do ask. It does not do any good and it does not reflect in the gospel to leave a person unhelped in a pattern of sin. It's not kind. It's not Christian kindness. You can overlook many sins, but there comes moments where we need to ask each other humbly. And if someone asks you, receive it humbly. 
and take it to the Lord, remembering you have much to do at home rather than looking at the person bringing it to you. Ask humbly. Fifth step, forgive generously. Generously. When the person comes back, almost always it's the case. I've almost always seen it to be the case that the first time someone becomes aware of their sin, they're aware of it as the tip of an iceberg. We're aware of the iceberg. They're aware of the tip. Yes, I was praying about that, and I think that comment did lack a bit of graciousness. Would you forgive me? And we think, a bit of graciousness? Are you aware that you have plunged an ocean liner into the bottom of the sea over and over? You have this behemoth gaping sin in your life, and what you're coming up with after your prayer for two minutes is a bit of ungraciousness. What kind of a blind Christian are you? That's probably not the most gracious response when a person confesses their sin. Enjoy and celebrate that they're seeing something. I forgive you. I forgive you, sister, for that bit of ungraciousness. <laughs> I'm always struck by the parable of the unmerciful servant. The servant comes back and his confession is basically, I will pay it all back. I mean, the king, I'd have been thinking, you still have no idea how much you owe me. <laughs> You'll pay it all back? Sure you will. I forgive you. I forgive it all. Forgive generously. Look for the smallest sight of sin in this person that is asking for forgiveness. And forgive generously. I forgive you. Don't withhold forgiveness because they haven't seen it all. I never see it all. Forgive generously. Forgive as you assume God forgives. Unless you think that you see all your sin and confessed every single moment of it to the Lord, and if you didn't, he has the right to withhold forgiveness, I don't think we want that. Forgive generously. And finally, seek help if necessary. If you've done those things, seek help. Don't reverse the order. Don't tell everybody what a loser this is and then confront them about their sin. Seek help if necessary. I, I've, I've tried it. This is not going well. Uh, okay, we need help. Uh, can you help me with this? That's what pastors are for. It's what care group leaders are for. Good, trusted, godly Christian friends. Can you, can you help us? Could you just meet with us and help us walk through this? And we, we want to be unified. We want to maintain the unity that reveals the worthiness of the gospel. Now, that's the long list. Here's a, here's a simple memorable list, okay? More memorable in the midst of it when you're like furious and angry and you can't remember six steps. Am I supposed to forgive generously or am I supposed to hit him? I can't really. It's too many steps. <laughs> Go up. Go in, go out. Go up, upward, inward, outward. Go up in gratefulness. Up in gratefulness. I've been saved. I've been saved. I'm really angry, but it's more important that I'm saved. Go in with humility. Where could I have handled this differently? Is there anything God's revealing about my heart? And then go out with love. Love them, either in overlooking or in gentle questions, asking for help. Up towards the Lord, you have saved me. Inward self-examination, outward in love. Don't get the order wrong. You change, then I'll change, then we'll be in church together. Wrong order. God has saved me. I still need to grow. I can love you. The glory of the gospel calling, the privilege and honor we have of being predestined to salvation, the honor we have of being included in the gospel community, to bear witness, remember chapter three, to bear witness to the angelic realm of the wisdom of God. Nothing less than an angelic display of God's wisdom is at work in the midst of Tuesday night's conflict with someone in this church. All of that relates to the next time someone lets you down or weighs you down or sins against you, or sins again, or is harsh, or is unkind. 
the way we relate to others is our estimation of the calling we have received. The way we respond to conviction in our relationships is our estimation of the calling we have received. Walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. My friends, I would urge us to honor the gospel in our relationships. Send this passage ahead, maybe to the next five minutes, maybe to the next five years. Send it ahead. This tells you what to do. It's hard. It's hard to do, but it tells you what to do so that you can glorify God in the midst of community when there is tension and difficulty. Live worthy of the gospel in the context of the gospel community. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that, that no one will ever or has ever born with sinners as you have born with us. You died for my sins. You bore my iniquities. My forgiveness came at the cost of your death and my standing, our standing with you is secure, is eternal, is unchanging. Your love never ends. And we thank you for that freedom, Lord. We thank you that that was our biggest problem and now our biggest identity. And we thank you for that. And Lord, I, I ask you that we would reflect that as a church. Lord, this, this relational context you've given us, it presses us beyond us. It's more than we can do. Lord, my sin is more than my brothers and sisters can bear. It, it just is. And there's going to come some moment where it is beyond their strength to bear. And so, Lord, I pray for them, and I pray for us as we relate to each other. Lord, when that, when that moment comes, or those moments come, when our sin or my sin is, is more than my brothers and sisters can bear, Lord, would you bear them up, Lord? You strengthen them. Because, Lord, I, I want to be loved in the midst of my sin, and I want to love others in the midst of their sin, but we need your Holy Spirit to sustain us as we seek to maintain the unity you've given to us and to be humble and gentle and patient and loving. Lord, would you please, please sustain us. Please unify us. Please preserve us. Lord, please guard us from, from running and from fighting. And Lord, help us to be loving. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would do this. In Jesus' name, amen.